Hello, everyone. I'm James Milan. Welcome to um, actually one of my favorite Talk of Town episodes uh, that we do regularly, and that is a legislative update uh, with our state senator, Cindy Friedman, who um, represents five cities and towns, but you know what? Lives in only one of them right here in Arlington. So, Cindy, so glad to have you with us. Uh, it's been a few months and uh, lots of busyness on your part. Hope you found some rest and relaxation somewhere over these last months. Thank you. Hi, James. It's good to see you. I'm glad to be here. Uh, yeah, I think things are getting closer to a new normal. That's a good thing. Yes. Um, well, obviously, the specter that you're referencing that we're all more than familiar with is the kind of derailment of legislative business, uh, as well as so much other, uh, so many other parts of our life by, by the pandemic, which um, has both, you know, again, derailed a certain amount of the business that you would have been taken care of um, and also exacerbated some of the issues that are most pressing anyway. So uh, we will get to that, but let me get your thoughts to begin with on well, just how things have proceeded more, you know, within the last few months since we last spoke. Uh, but if you want also over the, you know, the entire course of, of our response uh, here in Massachusetts to the pandemic, um, your own role, um, as much as you'd like to, to, to share that, but also just your, your, your comments and thoughts on, on how things have worked uh, on the state level. Sure. Um, I think things are moving in the right direction. Um, we uh, have or will very soon have over 50% of our um, adult <clears throat> population um, vaccinated with two vaccines. We have the lowest rate of hesitancy, I think, in the nation at 7%, which is um, pretty extraordinary. And I would say um, not unexpected in a place like Massachusetts, where people are well-educated, well-informed, um, thoughtful, uh, and um, and that we have a very strong sense of community. Um, and we understand that a vaccine is not just for me, it's for my neighbors and um, my, the people who run businesses, schools, et cetera. Um, so I think that all is working. Um, we've worked very hard to get vaccines down into the communities at the local levels. And that's finally, I think we're seeing a major shift um, I, the governor had announced that they were closing the big vaccine sites in June, and that just means that more of those vaccines will be coming locally, um, where our um, boards of health have been heroic in their um, work to get vaccines out to the most vulnerable people um, in our communities. And I just, I can't say enough about our local boards of health um, in my district across my district and, you know, in, and in Arlington. I mean, Christine Bongiorno is just uh, amazing, um, as are, <clears throat> you know, other, other local boards in, in my community. So I think that all is moving in the right direction. I think we're at a bit of a kind of turning point. Um, we can continue to get better. Um, and we could go back. And so that's kind of what we're all holding our breaths and wearing our masks for um, so that uh, we can keep this, this upward positive trend. So I think it's moving. We're still working very, very hard to get um, to the communities where there's more hesitancy, where there's less um, outreach or connection with healthcare and those people um, may not be hesitant, but just don't even know. And so uh, the, we have, I'm very proud of how um, much the Senate and the legislature has have pushed the governor to really focus on outreach and, um, and really go deep into the communities where people uh, are very vulnerable, but less connected to systems. And so I'm very proud of that work that we've done 
And I think we're starting to see um, some improvement. So it's a kind of mixed bag, but um, we'll keep focusing on it. Mm -hmm. I, I actually am I'm curious about one thing. You know, your, your <laughs> district encompasses, as I mentioned at the outset, um, a, a number of different towns and cities, uh, Arlington, Billerica, Burlington, Lexington, and Woburn. Um, are you finding that there are pockets within your own district uh, of, of, you know, greater either hesitancy or, or more difficulty with access or anything like that, um, or, 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 or not? But what are you finding within your own district? In terms of access, that was a major issue and I think I'm seeing it a lot less. I think people are, are things are getting much more accessible, especially in the areas of people who are homebound um, or <clears throat> less able to get to a vaccine, a large vaccine site. So I think while that was a major issue, that is, is has really, um, I think, been addressed and still need work to do, but there's a system in place. So I feel that we've made real progress there. Um, the hesitancy that I see in my communities, in my district, they're small pockets. They're not large groups. Um, and so I haven't really um, seen it as a major issue for, for, for me or for the uh, fourth middle sex. It's been much more, people are much more open once they hear about it. Um, lots and lots of people are um have gotten vaccines that's what we heard about in the beginning you know where am i getting where can i get it where can i get it so i don't see the hesitancy as much as some other people some other senators do yeah so uh one last thing before we move on to uh looking uh at in into the future rather than the past um but i can't uh not ask you uh about the fact that in speaking with our local officials both uh Christine Bongiorno, who you, you mentioned, uh, who directs our Board of Health, um, and also uh, Adam Chapdelaine over, you know, weekly over these last uh, months, they have at uh, different times expressed quite a bit of frustration uh, with the way that the rollout happened here in Massachusetts and, and specifically with the governor's uh, directives uh, around, um, around vaccine distribution, et cetera. Um, I'm wondering if you have, uh, if you could just weigh in on that um, uh, briefly, uh, again, before we move on. I completely understand and I share their frustration. And, um, you know, this is something that the Department of Public Health and local boards of health have been actually working on and training for, for 20 years, since 2001. Um, since September 11th. And I appreciate that we have a very, um, uh, what's the word I would use? We have a very large uh, public health system that is comprised of very, sometimes very small entities. So 351, 61 cities and towns, 51 cities and towns have their own boards of health and they are tasked with the charges that all the boards of health have. And it is absolutely true that there are some boards of health that are absolutely extraordinary and uh, uh, able to tackle anything. And there are other boards of health that aren't, um, because they live in very small communities or you know, for very legitimate reasons. We have not funded board, uh, public health. This is what happens when you don't fund public health or when you don't have a st an overall strategy. But having said that, I would have chosen to move vaccines to local boards of health that I knew and know were capable of getting vaccines out quickly, and then I would have dealt with the remainder. The governor said, nope, get big sites up, just get as many people vaccinated, just doesn't matter whoever can get there, get there. And that's the way he did it. And I, I disagree. Um, I'm not sure that we would have gotten, we wouldn't have gotten there any slower if we had actually used our local boards of health, but it is what it is. And, um, but I, I 
totally and completely share the frustration that Adam and Christine experienced and that all my local boards experienced. Just, they were all capable of doing a thousand shots, you know, in a couple of days. They got better and better at it. And to take them out of the mix, I think, just added a lot of angst and confusion that we didn't need to have. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for those those comments. We appreciate it. And certainly they do echo uh, a lot of the reasoning that, that, that Adam and Christine shared with us as well, especially, as you said, the fact that they've been preparing for a yeah. long, long time for exactly this kind of scenario. So it must be particularly frustrating to have your hands uh, tied, um, you know, when you're ready to go. Yeah. Um, all right, let's move on. Um, the, uh, you know, I want to focus on your legislative priorities and, and the session coming up, 21-22 session. Um, but, you know, as I looked at, uh, as I was preparing for our interview, I looked at, you know, some of the 40 bills that you uh, have, uh, you know, pending and, and the areas, uh, the 21 different areas, as I mentioned to you before, I counted them up, uh, uh, in which those, that legislation is happening. Uh, and obviously, I needed to wrestle uh, that down into something more manageable. And what it seems to me would be a good uh, focus for us is the, the as mentioned earlier, the, the pandemic caused some things actually made, made certain situations either worse or more urgent, et cetera. Um, and so I'd like to focus on some of those subject areas and just talk about uh, legislation coming up or that you hope uh, to make to to effect. Um, one of those areas is is housing. Um, as we know, uh, moratoria on um, on um, people being evicted has at both, is being lifted um, at both at the federal and at local levels. Um, and people, I think, are, are, are rightly concerned here in Massachusetts for a number of reasons um, about, about the housing situation. So what, um, what, what do you have going on in that area? I don't specifically, I don't have a specific housing bill. Um, I am, what I have learned yet again because I knew this, but learned it again, that if you are, if you are, if you want to focus on healthcare, that the first thing in healthcare that you have to ensure is that people have stable housing and they have food. And any, anything we do to increase health, the health of our citizens and our residents our residents has to encompass safe and secure housing and food security. And so what I have done is worked with my colleagues who are really focused on the nitty gritty of housing and how to make it more affordable and how to build more of it. I, have, I am working with them and taking their lead in that area. Um, and I will support and work for and be an advocate for anything that brings uh, stable, affordable housing to the Commonwealth. Because without it, we're sort of at square one, right? Um, it, you can't overstate the importance of those two things. If you want to keep people healthy, if you want to have a good economy, um, if you want to have a, a, a informed and engaged citizenry, um, you know, if you want good schools, if you want, you know, if you want to be able to, to provide education, it starts with food and housing. And we have really learned that yet again, right? I mean, one of the most shocking um, ramifications of this pandemic was to find out that how much food comes from our schools to children and without it they starve they don't have enough so we can't lose that focus and i will support all of the efforts um that are going on in the senate to increase you know to to make those things a reality for for people mm -hmm. Um, well, well said that, you know, the how pivotally and essentially important food and housing are to 
public health and to keeping people healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of which, I know that you know mental health um, has been a, a an issue around which you have been an active advocate, uh, you know, from 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 the get go, um, and that there that that is another area in which the pandemic has really increase both the need or the severity of the need, um, mm -hmm. as well as related to that substance abuse um, and the increasing uh, death toll uh, uh, really nationally. I'm, I'm less aware of what the impact has been here in Massachusetts, but I know it's been an epidemic of its own uh, nationally. So wondering um, if you could just speak to potential uh, legislation coming up in those areas. Sure, we have a couple of things that are going on um, right now. Hopefully I, uh, we will see in the Senate budget um, a um, uh, funding that will uh, directly and immediately address the um, issues around uh, um, emergency department boarding uh, for people with mental illness, especially for children, which is right now an epidemic in, of its own. Um, the number of children in uh, EDs waiting to get a placement somewhere to get treatment. Um, so we've been working as the chair of vice chair of Ways and Means. Um, I've been working on that part of the budget and hopefully we're gonna see some um, immediate uh, steps that we can take to reduce that. Uh, I, and, and we will continue um, to push up our bills that are around um, uh, parity and ensuring that behavioral health, um, including mental health and substance uh, use, uh, disorder treatment, are treated the same exact way that any uh, physical health um, uh, issue or condition is treated. Uh, as you know, and I've said several times with you, we have, uh, we have laws on the books, both at the state level and the federal level, that require uh, parity between behavioral health and physical health, and we don't enforce them. And we don't have true parity. And so I, I'm working on that, and we have, a, I think, a great uh, mental health parity bill that we'll be filing again. We did last session something that got derailed. Um, although the Senate did put it into its uh, mental health, did a big mental health omnibus bill, and they did put the parity bill in there. Um, so we'll be doing that again, um, and we'll be requiring um, much more um, enforcement and investigation to ensure that there is parity. Um, we also have, um, we'll again, be uh, looking at and have language if we need it to make sure that the um, doctor that that insurance companies have enough doctors on their uh, panels so that when people need help uh, they can get it and that's still the ghost networks are still an issue um, and so we'll be we'll be looking on uh, looking at that so those are the two big uh, mental health um, uh, bills that I have and um, there's a couple other things that we're going to be looking at and um, will be um, including in a, in a budget in a um, uh, another mental health bill which I hope the Senate will take up but those those are um, those are the two big ones right now mm -hmm. um, you know as you were answering that and you you refer to your your work and your position on the house uh, on the um, not the house excuse me on the Ways and Means Committee um, it uh, that reminds me that um, I wanted just to ask you about the budget um, and uh, what what are you uh, what are you seeing in, as you look forward to this next session and also this next budget year this next fiscal year um, are you hopeful with the influx of federal money are you um, well, just what are your thoughts in terms of uh, our budgetary situation here in Massachusetts, uh, both currently and as we look forward? Yeah, well, I think to a lot of people's surprise, our revenues are up. Um, we're doing really much better than anybody thought in terms of, you know, 
of revenue to the state. And that, that's been enormously helpful. And, um, and in addition, we have uh, an administration at the federal level who believes that it, this is the time that government steps in and helps. And so between uh, the Rescue Act has been extraordinarily helpful, has taken a lot of pressure off states um, and municipalities. And, you know, if we can get an infrastructure bill, that will be, um, that will be enormously helpful. Um, the issues around childcare that they're addressing, that will be helpful because that will allow people to come back to work. Um, so I am um, cautiously optimistic that um, things will continue in this trend. I think right now we're in pretty good shape um, in terms of the state and being able to fund the things that we really care about, like local aid and education and healthcare and, um, and safety net programs. So I think that that, you know, without burdening um, the residents by raising, you know, enormous amount of taxes or, you know, that kind of thing, even though, you know, that may be something in the future. But right now, I think we're in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm curious about one one thing. I know a little bit about here on our, at the very local level here at Arlington, that some of the influx of money that's coming in through these federal support acts um, or this funding coming from the federal government um, is actually creating odd uh, problems um, in terms of just being able to figure out how to deal with a uh, what can feel like a flood of money coming in. Is there any such thing uh, as as similar problems uh, on, on the state level where, uh, you know, it, it's actually an issue to figure out how to spend the money? I don't think it's it. I don't think the issue is how to spend it. it. I think the issue from the way I understand it is what you're allowed to spend it on. So the money has come, but the guidances have come or are coming after the money or after the money's been allocated. Allocated. Uh -huh. um, and I think that's what a bit of the confusion is. And that's what it makes it makes it hard for the state. So. For instance, I'll give you an example. I'm pushing a um, uh, I'm pushing a budget item that would create a um, loan repayment program for uh, psychiatrists, child psychiatrists who would work in community health centers. Okay, and it and it would be a significant loan repayment in the hundreds of thousands. Okay, now. We're getting money from the federal government, right? And one could argue that, oh, a loan repayment program is a perfect way to use money because it's bounded. It's not a continual, you know, you don't have right. to um, allocate it every year. It's like a good, it, it's sort of, it's, it fits a lot of buckets and it's something that we really need because we need to get people into the healthcare system um, but we don't know if you can use it that way, right? We're not sure, and we're not sure when it's coming, and we're not sure, you know, so what do you do? Do you put it in part of your budget um, and, and bake it into a state budget, or do you say, well, we're not going to do that yet, but and we'll wait? Well, how long do you need to wait? And, you know, the need is now. And so, so I think that's a lot of the churn that at least I'm seeing is, what can we do with this bucket and what can we do with this bucket? Yeah, that's that's a that's a great point. I'm I'm wondering if there you, you are familiar, I'm sure, with the adage uh, that, you know, there are some some kinds of positions in which it's better to ask for forgiveness afterwards than for permission yeah. before. Uh, <laughs> is this one of those situations where you know it's it seems like responsible actors at the at the state level are saying well we need to wait and see if it's okay to spend this money i'm wondering hey maybe we should is is there a possibility that you move forward with allocating the money um and then assume that you've got it right or when 
when you hear otherwise, you seek forgiveness, so to speak, in some way? Um, yeah, I'm not, that... I'm not totally sure that that will work because the issue is if you don't get forgiveness, then you're on the hook to pay, <laughs> the hook to pay for it. And we've right. already allocated all of our dollars to other, you know, to other things. So you, you don't want to get into the position of saying, okay, you know, I told you I'd give you money. Sorry. <laughs> You have to take right. it. So I think I think the the um, responsible financial gals and guys would say, uh, 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 "No, we right. can't. We can't count on that because it's yeah. we can't." And also, they can't spend the money because they don't have it yet. So, but it's a really so. So, in other words, uh, it, it does it, it does show that that's a really good illustration of what a problem so to speak or at least a problematic situation that can arise is yeah. if you get if you know the money's coming but it's not yet there and or you don't know if you're allowed to spend it in the ways right. you want yeah. then and it's, it'll get it'll you know, get cleared up i mean it you know it'll get cleared up we just happen to be in the middle of our budget cycle so it's really important to us right but other places are done their budgets and so they don't have that same um issue at least that's my understanding of, of what's going on you know, we've talked uh, about a, a number of different areas in which the kind of the long tail of, of the pandemic is continuing to play out and, 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 um, and intersecting with your work as legislators. Um, the other great, um, what would you call it? Um, well, the other reckoning uh, for sure that we are all going to forever associate 2020 with um, and into 2021 and beyond, um, it relates to racial equity, police reform, and uh, those kinds of issues. Um, obviously, here in Massachusetts, a significant bill uh, is, is, you know, we've newly passed around police reform. Uh, I'm wondering whether there is anything um, coming up that is worth mentioning in the area of either criminal justice reform generally police reform specifically, et cetera, that you'd be aware of? There are a number of things that are coming up in, I think, around criminal justice. Um, I would say, um, from my point of view and what I'm working on in, in terms of police reform is um, we need to make sure that if, if we're transitioning um, our police from a sort of warrior to guardian, um, frame of reference that we make sure that we provide resources um, that allow that to happen. Um, and that means, you know, how well do we train our police to um, be able to de-escalate? Um, what are what are our expectations of um, of of how um, of how police respond? Um, a really good example of that is Arlington has all has has for many years, and it came under um, because of Chief Ryan and is um, and is um, wholly embraced by Chief Flaherty. Is this notion of ride along, um, you know, of uh, um, social workers, people who are really trained in de-escalation, really trained in working with people who have a mental health or substance use disorder uh, condition going on at a moment. They, they are with the police. And that is, I think, an extraordinarily good model. And that's the kind of thing where we say, yes, we have an expectation that you will treat people um, in a certain way, but we are gonna give you the tools and resources to do that. And I think that's what my focus is right now because you can't expect people to, do, to be experts at everything all the time, right? We never, we don't expect that. And so I think in this case, we want to make sure that um, in terms of just policing and, this, you know, um, that if we have these expectations, which are absolutely, I think, um, appropriate, that we make sure that we can support those efforts by providing police with the resources that they need. Um, in terms of criminal justice, we have so much to do in terms of our departments of correction. And um, right now, Interestingly, our um, census for uh, DOC is down, so we have many, we have many fewer uh, prisoners. 
the prisoners with a mental uh, health condition or a substance use disorder is way up. So more and more, our prisons are becoming the treatment, the, the treatment options for people who actually have an illness. And this is just intolerable. Um, we have women in prisons that really don't need to be there. Um, they are there because of a domestic violence issue that, um, you know, for, in, for example, and there are so many better ways to treat that, to work with people who, you know, who have dealt with that, with trauma. Um, our, I, 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 I ask everybody to read the, the Trump Department of Justice report on how people who have a mental illness and, and are put on suicide watch, how they have been treated in the jails. It is horrific. It is like reading about a third world country. And so these are all issues that we need to address. Because if you don't fix the Department of Correction, if you don't fix, fix incar incarceration, you just cause more incarceration. So people get, people get, um, they're sick, they come in, they don't get treatment, they get worse, they get, they leave with no support, and they just go back into the cycle. So we really, really, really need to focus on that. And I am, I have to say, I am extremely disappointed and frustrated with this administration and um, and their willingness and seriousness about reforming our Department of Corrections. Yes, and uh, you know, there's a lot in what you said there, uh, both with relation in relation to police reform uh, and the situation in our in our jails and prisons right now. Um, but what I'm struck by is the common theme there that. In people intersecting with the police more than has ever been recognized before um, are dealing with other issues beyond whatever the specific, uh, you know, police training would 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 uh, you know make that officer think. And so, um, a lot of as as you're aware of, of course, there's a, there's a a whole defund the police idea um, that is frankly sounds like not very popular with large segments of the population but a lot of that is really divert what lies behind that seems to be diverting um, more resources away from traditional policing and more towards provision of mental health uh, professionals on scene and in counseling and training of police officers around these things we know that we're lucky here in arlington that as you have already cited, there's been a program in place and a vision in place around this for years. Also, that is reflected in Middlesex County to some to, to some degree, yeah. uh, where there's that kind of. So, so I feel like we are uh, in a you know in, in a relatively good position compared to many other parts of the country. And yet, you point out rightly and with passion that there is so much. That is still not being done uh, right um, or enough uh, in 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 our state, mm -hmm. um, and and it's you know it's definitely a sobering uh, reminder that um, you know progress has been made and so much more needs to be yeah. done. And I don't mean to minimize the racial disparities or the disparities between treatment between people of color and and you know and people who are Caucasian. I, I don't mean to minimize that. I know that that is a huge issue um, and it's something that we need to um, address head on. And, you know, um, but I do believe that, you know, there's, there's, um, I do believe that when we have an expectation of our systems that we need to be ensure that the systems can you know, can do what we're, what we're directing them to do. And, you know, um, I'm very proud of the police reform bill that we did. Um, I think it's totally in the right direction. Um, and I also believe that there are lots of people out there, lots of police officers who want to do things differently and we have to make sure that they have the resources to do it. Um, 
I've got just one other thing that I'm going to want to ask you about, but before I do, I wanted to invite you, if we have missed any, if there's any glaring areas or particular bills that you wanted to make sure that our audience hears about and we haven't mentioned, please do. Um, <laughs> I'm sure my staff is going to watch this and say, you didn't say this, and you didn't say this, and you didn't say this, and I'm going to say, you're right. But... Um, <laughs> Uh, That's what part of what we like about you, though, Cindy, is that you, you, you know, you are who you are, and you know you're not going to get everything right. Right. It's like, oh, I forgot that. Uh. So anyway, no, but people should come to my uh, office hours. That's one thing I'd like to say. Um, they're always on our website. We text out that we're having them. Um, they're all on Zoom now, so they're easy to, you know, to get to, and. Um, um, so, it, you know, go to the website or uh, watch for tweets or on Facebook because um, we're, we're announcing when they are and it would be great for people. If they just want to talk about things that they care about, that would be wonderful. That's that's great. And that does remind me uh, uh, of a question that, that, that I am curious about. It's something that we are dealing with in town meeting here in Arlington right now. Um, you were just saying that because of the pandemic, as we know, things migrated to Zoom. Um, we are getting, you know, we are beginning to envision getting back to a place where we're dealing with each other face to face again as, a, as the norm. Um, when that happens and when that's possible, do you plan to, do you have, have you guys thought about and do you plan to keep this remote option, remote participation option, um, you know, available for people? Generally, I think yes. I think generally, um, in some ways, this has worked really well. And I mean, you can see it in the participation of um, just town meetings, not town meeting, but right, meetings right. From, you know, how many more Government people meetings. show up and how many more people watch. And, um, and that's all. That's great. Um, I don't think we yet have a good idea about how to mix those two. Uh, but I think there's a general acknowledgement that we probably have to do a mixture of both because it does work. And it, and it, and in certain ways, it, in certain very profound ways, it, it really expands access. Um, and that's great. In other ways, we really need to be together. Um, so we have covered a lot of ground as I expected um, and touched on some really important issues that have been key uh, for you and your time uh, in the state house, um, you know, from uh, the mental health and, and, and health in general uh, issues through criminal justice reform, through, uh, you know, housing and the other, th and other things that as we know um, have been great priorities for you. I think, though, that people may be wondering, well, why hasn't he asked her about the most important thing? And so let me do that. And, and that is, is it true that the giant puffball mushroom is really going to be declared the mushroom of the state, the official it state? It better mushroom? be. If I have any say <laughs> over it, it will be. Um, is the giant puffball a personal favorite of yours is that it absolutely and it was it was brought to me by a then junior high student in arlington who is a micrologist my okay the word just went out of my head but a mushroom expert okay and um it's a wonderful bill and he's a incredibly <laughs> cool kid and um so yeah, we're pushing All it. Right. We're serious. Take, exactly. So take note, folks out there. Yeah. Um, these are the kinds of things that if you show up during Cindy's <laughs> office hours, you've got a legitimate chance of making these things happen. Absolutely. All right, well, <laughs> I appreciate uh, that and, and ending on, uh, on a note that is, you know, light, but Nonetheless, you know, it's it's I love the origin story of that bill. That's great that uh, that this is somebody who cares a lot about it and brought yeah. it to your attention and you're going to be responsive. Absolutely. I mean, it's a, it's a it's a good idea and it shows passion and fortitude. <laughs>
All right, just like the giant puffball itself. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> All right, no more mentions of that. Uh, Cindy, thanks again uh, for your time. And uh, yeah. this has been basically the spring edition of these uh, legislative updates, and we'll look forward to checking in with you in the summer, uh, even as we also uh, wish you uh, the opportunity to get away. Uh, at some point uh, this summer and, and do some R&R &R for yourself. It's been a very, very long year and, a, and plus for all of us, but certainly for those of you um, in the Massachusetts State House, it's been, yeah. it's been a lot to do. Yeah, well, thank you. And um, thanks for all your um, civic mindedness. And, um, and I really appreciate that you do this and that you give me an opportunity to um, to just have a conversation. It's great. Well, we, uh, as I said, we, we really do value it. And just so you know, I've been speaking to our state senator, Cindy Friedman, from her home right here in Arlington. Um, and uh, we do, as I said, wish her the best. And we do wish the same for you out there in the audience. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm James Milan, and we'll see you next time.